Gospel Church, we just want to welcome you and say it's good to have you. Good to see you. Nice to meet you this morning. My name is Clint. I'm a pastor here. Let me ask you a, a question this morning. What was the last thing that you were personally uh, invited to? Not a group invitation, but, but a, a, a personal invitation. Maybe it was to someone's home. Uh, maybe it was to, uh, to go for a walk or to meet someone for a coffee. When was the last time you were personally invited somewhere? It feels great to be personally invited, right? Certainly there's a place for, you know, group or, or mass invitations, but a personal invitation always feels the best because it means someone's been thinking about you. Someone wants to spend time with you. It's personal. Earlier this summer, I was uh, having a coffee near this, this big church uh, in my hometown. And I thought, oh, it might be nice to go to this church and, you know, introduce myself. Maybe they want to share, you know, about what God is doing here in Poland or how we're trying to help Ukrainians. Uh, so I went to the church. I pushed on the door. The, the door was locked. So I had to push some button and someone came, you know, to the door to see what I, I needed. And so they opened the door. So I'm kind of standing in the doorway, trying not to let the, the door close on me and, uh, you know, talking about who I am and meeting this person. And the person from the church was, was nice, but it was clear that they had other things to do. So after a few minutes, you know, we just kind of wrapped up and I let the clo door close and, and uh, uh, I was gone. So it wasn't a bad experience because, you know, he didn't know me at all. I was just a stranger, but I definitely didn't feel, let's say, invited that day. Well, fast forward to a couple weeks later, I was at my brother's house. One of his friends came over with, with, uh, with another friend, and I started talking to the other friend, and uh, uh, we got to know each other, and it turns out he is uh, one of the main pastors at this big church where I was. And he said, hey, pick a day of the week, I'll meet you, and I'll give you a tour and, you know, introduce you to everyone in the church. And so later that week, I met him at the church. The doors opened. I didn't have to push a button or anything. I'm, I'm welcomed in. He takes me all over the church. He introduces me to people, said, hey, this is my new friend, Clint. I want you to meet him and get to know him. Everyone stops what they're doing and takes time to talk to me. And it was a fantastic and great experience. So it was the same location, but I had two completely different experiences. The first time I was at the church, I was standing in the doorway trying not to let the, the door uh, crush me. The second time I was walking through, I was welcomed, I was getting this guided personal tour. So what was the difference between the two experiences? Well, the first time I wasn't invited, but the second time I was personally invited. And that personal invitation made all the difference. This morning, I want us to think about invitations on a, on a couple different levels. Uh, and I'd also like to speak a little bit to, to what uh, God taught me while me and my family were, were in the States the past few weeks. And the question I, I want to ask you this morning is, what is Jesus personally inviting you to? And are you inviting others to come along with you, to come and see what God has. Well, that's what we want to look at this morning. So if you have a Bible, turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 1. We also will have the text up for you on the screen. Gospel of John, chapter 1. The theme for the church this year is we've been looking at is at the very end of John when Jesus tells Nathaniel that he is going to see God do even greater things than what Jesus did with the fig tree. Um, and so we, that's what we're continuing to do this year, to trust that God's going to do greater things this year. But I want to back up a bit in chapter 1. Uh, look with me at verses 35 and 36. It says, The next day again, John, this is John the Baptist, was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. Of course, we're at the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry. Uh, we know John the Baptist came, the way, uh, came to prepare the way for the Lord, to prepare people for the coming Messiah. So there were some who followed John's teachings. Therefore, they were his disciples, or we could say they were his, his learners, his students. 
And in this moment in the Gospels, there's going to be a transition as John's disciples become the disciples of Jesus. So John is standing there with two of his disciples, and, and Jesus Christ walks by. And John says, behold, which means look and see something incredible. And he declares Jesus to be the Lamb of God. This is what John declares a few verses earlier in verse 29. And to read that, it says, The next day John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So again, John sees Jesus coming and says, He's here. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, this is the Messiah. This is the one I've been prophesying about. This is the one I've been preparing you for. I've been baptizing people so that Jesus can be revealed to you. Of course, we know that Jesus will be the Lamb because he will sacrificially die on the cross for sin. Jesus had no sin. Therefore, he was the spotless Lamb. He was the Lamb without blemish. But we had sin, and the only way to appease the wrath of God was for blood to be shed for that sin. And Jesus willingly laid down his life so that our sin might be paid for, that we might be reconciled to God. You know, sometimes we try to be the lamb. We try to pay for our sins. But we know from the Bible, it says that we'll never be good enough. We can never pay for our own sins. But Jesus, the Lamb of God, did in love by dying on the cross. You know, one of the things I had to get used to when I moved to to Poland is what it means to invite someone to something. Uh, Because where I grew up, an invitation was only an invitation. Like if I said, do you want to meet for coffee? It means, do you want to meet for a coffee? But when I moved to Poland, and maybe it's like this in other countries too, I noticed that when someone would invite me to something, they would often insist on paying the bill. So if someone invited me for coffee at a restaurant, at the end they would insist on paying for the coffee because they were the ones who invited me. And after some time, maybe a few years, it took me a while, I realized if you invite someone to something, it means that you are going to pay for whatever the cost there is. If you're inviting someone to coffee, The person inviting is paying for the person they invited. I thought I was supposed to pay for myself, but it's the person inviting who pays. I imagine it's like that in a lot of countries in the world. But I also think it's a great visual, it's a great picture of the gospel, of the good news of Jesus Christ. Jesus invites us to follow him, and Jesus pays the cost. He is the lamb who pays for our sin. Jesus says, don't try to pay for your sin yourself because it's not possible. You can't do it. And also Jesus paid the cost on the cross himself. He was the perfect sacrifice. He was the spotless lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And we are to behold him, to worship him, to be amazed by him. This is what brings us into worship. This is why we worship with such joy. Jesus invites you, and also Jesus pays for the cost, 100%. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Verse 37, the two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, what are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? So two of John's disciples Here, John described Jesus as the Lamb of God. They immediately began to to follow Jesus. Again, this was a transition time. People had been following John, but John came to prepare the way for Jesus. And normally when we talk about following Jesus, we talk about it in a spiritual way. So we might say, God is leading me to change my job, so I will follow him and I will trust him. That's how we typically mean Uh, what we typically mean when we say following Jesus. We mean it spiritually. But here we see these two disciples were following Jesus physically. Jesus was walking by. John declares him to be the Lamb of God. And then the disciples start to walk behind Jesus. We know this because Jesus turns around 
He sees them falling behind them, and he says, what are you seeking? What are you looking for? What do you want? Jesus is getting to the core question. Their reply, they reply by calling him rabbi, which means teacher. And they ask Jesus, where are you staying? Perhaps their question implies that they thought maybe they were bothering Jesus or, or maybe Jesus was too busy, so they tried to get his contact so they could, you know, come back uh, uh, and, and meet him later. But Jesus doesn't say, yeah, 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 come back to me later. I got too much going on. Jesus doesn't say, come back to me tomorrow. Right now I'm too busy. Jesus replies to them with an invitation. Verse 39. He said to them, come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was the 10th hour. Jesus wasn't too busy for them. On the contrary, he invites them over to his place. He says, come and you will see. It's a reminder that we serve the God who invites us. He doesn't grab us by the neck and drag us to where he wants us to go. No, instead, he leads the way. He guides the way. He shows the way. And he turns back to us and says, hey, follow me. Come and see. Of course, we must decide whether or not to follow. The disciples that day could have said, "Uh, no, thanks. We got too much to do today. I'm I'm too hungry. Uh, I've got other obligations. They could have said that. But they didn't. It says that they went to Jesus' place around the 10th hour, and they ended up staying the rest of the day. That day, Jesus invited the two disciples into a relationship with him. They went to his place. They probably had a meal together. They spent time together. They probably talked a lot. It was sweet. It was intimate. It was personal. Of course, we know from the rest of the gospel, Gospels that the road to following Jesus isn't easy. It wasn't easy for these two disciples. Sure, they were able to see the miracles. They were able to see Jesus turn water into wine and walk on water. But they also saw the persecution from the people. They saw the cost of following Jesus Christ, and ultimately they saw Jesus, their Lord, die on the cross. Jesus wasn't inviting them to an easy life, but he was inviting them to real, true, resurrected life, the abundant life That only comes through following him. Verse 40. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means the Christ. So one of the two disciples that day was was Andrew, who we find out was, was Peter's brother. We don't see Andrew a lot in the Gospels, but as one author said, Whenever we see Andrew in the Gospel of John, he is always bringing someone to Jesus. Not only does Jesus invite us to follow him, he also uses us to bring others to him as well. So Andrew goes to his brother Peter and says, we found him. We found the Messiah, the promised one. The Messiah was was one that the Jews at the time were anxiously waiting for for centuries The Messiah was the anointed one who was coming to save God's people. It reminds us of of King David in the Old Testament at the height of of Israel's glory in 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 the Old Testament. But, of course, we know from the New Testament that Jesus was not some sort of political savior. He was and is the savior of the world who came to take away our sins. He didn't come to bring world peace. He came to bring us peace with God Through him. Probably Andrew didn't know all this at the time, but that was okay. God was working in his heart and he was responding to it. You know, sometimes we think we need to have all the answers before we take the next step step of faith that God has for us. But generally, that's just not true. We simply need to trust God, take that step of faith, and that in confidence that God will provide us all the answers that we need. That day, Andrew knew something was happening. He knew there was something about Jesus that was stirring his heart. So he goes to his brother, invites him to come. You know, I can't count the number of times I've heard someone give their testimony. And it starts with, well, my friend invited me to church. 
Maybe that's your testimony. It begins with, well, I had a friend or I had a family member. I had a brother like Andrew, and he invited me to church. You know, sometimes when we think about reaching out to our friends and to our family, in our minds we can make it be this big and complicated thing. And sometimes it, sometimes it is. Sometimes it is hard conversations, long conversations with ups and downs. But other times, God uses the most simple and sincere things, like inviting someone to church, inviting someone to a Bible study. You know, I don't know about you, but I've never been personally offended by someone inviting me to something. I don't recall being offended by a friend who invited me over for dinner. I don't remember being in Uh, offended by someone inviting me to an event. Because personal and sincere invitations are nice. They're sweet. We like them. Jesus invites us to invite others. Group invitations are okay. There's a place for that. But personal invitations are the best. You know, this semester, as we start a new semester here, I just want to challenge you this semester to invite one person to church. If you want to invite 100 people, great. God bless you. Uh, But if you've never invited anyone to anything or that, that kind of makes you nervous, I want to challenge you to invite one. To, to pray about it, to ask God to lead you to that person who, who God might be preparing to, to come with you. To pray about it. Ask the Holy Spirit to guide you. And there's a chance that, yes, they could say, no, I don't want to come. But I have to think that there's at least one person in your life that God has put there who would respond to that personal invitation. You know, I'm always surprised by the number of emails I get uh, from the church website from strangers, um, from people who uh, email me and say, hey, is the church meeting? Is it okay if I come? And, and what I'm thinking is, well, everyone's invited. It's not a closed meeting. You don't need a personal invitation to come. Of course you can come. But at the same time, I think I understand how much warmer it feels for someone to say, yeah, please come. Come and see what God, has done, what God is doing. Come and meet this Jesus that we worship. It's personal. Andrew invites Peter to meet the Messiah, and Peter comes. Verse 42. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You should be called Cephas, which means Peter. So Andrew brings Peter to Jesus, and Jesus says he already knows who Peter is. He's Simon, the son of John. Peter is meeting Jesus for the first time, but Jesus has known who Peter is his whole life. That's true for us today as well. Even if you don't know Jesus, even if you don't have a relationship with him, even if you've never followed him, God knows you. The Bible says God created you in his image. He fearfully and wonderfully made you. He knows your past. He knows your present. He knows your future. He knows your good days. He also knows your bad days. He knows your triumphs, and he knows your deepest, darkest sins. And yet, he still invites you to follow him. The Bible says that while we were still sinners, still sinners, Christ died for us. God doesn't wait for you to clean yourself up and then follow him. Instead, he invites you to follow him. The Bible says he is faithful and just to cleanse you from all unrighteousness, to make you clean from Christ. Jesus says to Peter, I know who you are. But he also says to Peter, I know who you will become. The name Peter meant rock, or we could say rocky. It was kind of a nickname back then. And so when Jesus says that he's changing his name to Cephas, which also means rock, Back then, in Jewish culture, changing a name was a a major thing. One author says, Jesus is here asserting his authority over Peter and telling him that he is a different man, a man who is about to acquire the character of his true name, a name that he has likely forgotten. 
It is striking that rock is not the image that comes to mind when we see Peter in the Gospels. Peter is impulsive and in the end denies Jesus. But despite Peter's frailty, this name signals Jesus' vision for what Peter will become. Jesus is declaring something about who Peter would become after following him. We don't necessarily see it in the Gospels, but we definitely see it in the book of Acts. God uses Peter to build his church. It's a reminder that God can look at us today and see potential even when we don't see it sometimes. We might look in the mirror and see everything that's wrong with us, everything that, that, that's not there. We might look in the mirror and see all of our mistakes, see all of our regrets. But the Lord looks at us and sees our potential. He sees the good works that he has prepared in advance for you to do, not for your own glory, but for the glory of God. When we follow Jesus, when we trust him, God transforms our lives. He does things that we don't believe are possible. We are new creations. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. A few weeks ago, I was talking to someone, and they mentioned uh, a phrase I had never heard before. And the phrase was called uh, imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome. Maybe, maybe you've heard of it. It's basically when a successful person doesn't believe in their own success. So despite their success, they are full of doubt. They don't believe that they are truly confident. They don't see themselves the way everyone else does as a, as a, as a success. So everyone else might view them as, as a successful person, but they still feel like a fraud. They still feel like an imposter. You know, and I think we can all relate to that sometimes. At least I know I can. Other people might think we're doing great or that we have everything sorted out and, and everything put together. But in our minds, we can think, oh, if they only knew the real me, full of doubts, full of problems, they just have no idea. But when we read about Peter's name change in the Gospel of, of Matthew, we see an important note. Jesus told Peter, you are Cephas, and on this rock I will build my church. It's not about us doing great things for God. It's about God doing great things in you. If it were dependent on us, then of course we would feel like imposters. Of course we would feel like frauds. But it's not dependent on you. It's God working in and through you to accomplish his purposes. God sees who you are, but he also sees how much more he can use you in the future. You know, Peter doesn't really do much here at the beginning of John's gospel. But he actually does the most important thing. When his brother invited him to go and meet Jesus, Peter went. That's how Peter's story began. Peter's testimony begins with, yeah, yeah, my, my brother invited me to, 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 to meet Jesus. And ultimately, he became what the Bible says is one of the pillars of the early church. In other words, a pillar is a rock. Peter indeed became the rock upon uh, which God built his church. Jesus did the work. Peter simply followed. Last verse is verse 43 through 46. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, can anything good come from Nazareth? And Philip said to him, come and see. Again, Jesus' invitation to Philip is, is simple. We see in verse 33, it's two words. Follow me. That's the Christian life, listening to his voice, listening through God's words through the Bible, being sensitive to his spirit, following Jesus. We follow him because we know his voice. He goes before us. He leads us. He guides us. We follow him. He protects us. It's personal. In Matthew chapter 4, Jesus said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. In Mark chapter 8, Jesus said, if, 
If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. In John 8, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. In John chapter 10, Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them, and they follow me. The Christian life, simply put, is following Jesus, and he doesn't lead us to bad places. He leads us to good places. He is the good shepherd. He cares about his sheep. He cares about you, and he calls you to follow him just as he called Philip that day. Some days it feels like we are running after him. Some days it feels like we're just kind of walking after him. Other days it feels like we are barely crawling after him. But following Jesus means we keep going. We keep moving, even when we're discouraged, even when we want to quit, because we trust that he is good. Here Philip decides to follow Jesus, goes and finds his friend Nathaniel, and, and says, hey, we found him. We found the Messiah. Here he is, Jesus of Nazareth. Of course, Nathaniel doesn't respond as everyone else has responded so far. He doesn't say, great, let's go. Let's do this. Yeah, let's follow him. Instead, he's skeptical. Instead, he's not sure. He says, Nazareth, can anything good come from there? But instead of Philip getting into a deep discussion about Nazareth, he, he tells his friend, hey, just come. And see, it's a personal invitation. Come and see is such a wonderful, simple invitation, but it's so powerful. Instead of us feeling like we need to do all the work, we trust Jesus to do the work in people's hearts. We covered the rest of Nathaniel's story earlier this year, but the short version is that Nathaniel too ultimately followed Jesus and became his disciple. He responded to the invitation. When I was in the, in the States the, this summer, you know, I got to visit a lot, of, a lot of churches. And churches of different sizes, churches of different uh, areas from different places, some small churches, some, some big churches. But that wasn't the difference I noticed when I attended these churches. The biggest difference I noticed this time were the churches that were really personal and the churches that were, let's say, less personal. The churches that were less personal were were still great churches. God uses them. They had tremendous music. They had great teaching. And there's nothing wrong with them. They were great churches. But I found myself more drawn to the churches that were warm, that were inviting, that made time and space for some personal moments. In those churches, not everything went perfectly when they gathered. But no one cared because it felt like a family. And so even as Gospel Church continues and grows, I came away thinking, you know, I always want this church to be personal, to be warm, to be inviting. And so I want to start doing something at the end of sermons. In light of today's sermon, I want to have a time of what we call a time of invitation. Now, some of you might already know what I mean because you grew up in churches that, that had this time every Sunday. The church I grew up in had an invitation at the end of every sermon. We typically haven't had one here at Gospel Church uh, because normally we'd say, hey, if you want prayer, if you want to discuss what it means to follow Jesus, you know, find me at the end of the service. And when the church is smaller, that's okay. kind of works. But as a church grows, sometimes there can be a, a line to, to, to speak with me or whomever. Uh, after we finish, then the moment passes. Maybe you're busy and you have to go, and, and sort of the moment is, is gone. And so we want to create space and time during the worship service for you to respond to whatever God is putting on your heart. I'm going to be here in the front uh, when the band uh, leads us in worship. And we'll be available to to pray with you or help you find the next steps to take. Remember, it's Jesus' invitation. It's not my invitation. It's Jesus' call, not our call. We are merely here like the apostle Philip to say, come and see. Come and taste and see that the Lord is good. You know, my wife, Melissa, grew up in a church that didn't have a time of invitation So the first time she visited the church I grew up in, she felt so bad for the pastor when no one came forward. 
And I told her, hey, it's okay. It's, 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 it's not about the pastor. It's not a reflection on the quality of, of the sermon. It's merely an opportunity for people to do business with God. And that can be done quietly in your seat, or someone can come down and be prayed for. It's exactly as advertised. It's a time of invitation. So right now I'm going to invite the, the worship team uh, to come up. And they're going to lead us in a, in a song of, of worship. And as they lead us, I'm going to be over here at the, at the front. And maybe this morning is the very first time you've heard about what it means to follow Jesus. And God is working and stirring in your heart. I invite you to come forward and just, just say, hey, I want to follow Jesus today. I want to learn more of what that means. Or perhaps God is putting someone on your heart to invite to church or to engage with the gospel. And you just want prayer for, for boldness and courage to invite them. I invite you to come. Or maybe you're just going through something tough right now, and you just want to be prayed for. You want someone to listen. I invite you to come. As I said, this is an invitation, a time for you to respond to God. Let me pray for us. Father God, we thank you that you are uninviting God. God, that you welcome us and say, come and follow me. God, it's so simple, but sometimes the most simple things are the hardest. God, we want to, to follow you. Maybe there's people in here today who have been following you for years, but they feel stuck. They feel trapped. They feel like something's blocking them. Perhaps you've shown them that next step to take, but fear or whatever is, is holding them back. God, we pray that we would be faithful to, to lay that down in front of you. Maybe some of us can identify with Nathaniel. We hear your invitation, but we're so full of doubt. We're so full of questions. God, you're faithful to, to answer those questions. But at the end of the day, you still ask us to trust you. So God, we commit this time to you, praising you that you're the God who invites us. May we be faithful to respond. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.